uh, let's, let's, let's look at this text and uh, be encouraged and challenged by the word. March, uh, Mark chapter 10, verse 13, and the following. Mark 10, 13, and they were bringing children to him that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witnesses. Witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing, go, sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. I'll read down to that that, that point uh, for now. Now, even just as we read it together, I'm, I'm sure that it comes to you as a great challenge if Jesus met you today, and he said, well, you need to just sell every single penny you have, get rid of them. You have let them go, and then follow me empty-handed. What would be your answer? How do we take a passage like this? How do we understand it? How do we apply it? Uh, How do we take this with us and, and make it come home, in a sense? To, to, to come to understand the heart of God. And that's the challenge we have today. Uh, you notice that I read through two different stories, right? But I think they are related. Okay, first story is about parents who are bringing their little children to Jesus. And they want Jesus to anoint, you know, touch them, like bless them by putting his hands on them and, and, and really uh, uh, bless these little children because these are precious kids to them, right? But the disciples seeing this, are in, they're, they're, they're really upset about what's happening. Isn't Jesus so much occupied by much more important things in his, in his life calling? Isn't Jesus casting out demons? Isn't he healing those who are sick? Isn't Jesus preaching the kingdom of God, which is at hand? Uh, Jesus has this incredibly important job to do right now, and why should these little kids come and bother him? Uh, and when Jesus took note of this, it says he was indignant. And that's a strong word, isn't it? He was very, very upset, not by the children coming to him, but by the disciples stopping them and rebuking the parents. Jesus loved these little children. It's, it's, it's very interesting, isn't it? And do we really love children like Jesus loved them? Maybe you love your children. Uh, I have a hard time relating to my grandkids. Um, even yesterday, one of the one of the, young, the, the youngest of my three grandsons, right to my face, he said, I don't like you. So it's, it's kind of sad, and I realize I'm not very good at, at dealing with these children and impressing them uh, with lots of love. Uh, but this is far more than that, isn't it? You know, what is said here is, is more than that. Jesus was indignant because he was misunderstood. The disciples didn't quite understand you know, who were the important people in the life of Jesus? Uh, imagine me sitting in my office expecting a very important guest. Uh, my office isn't set up like that, so hopefully you won't misunderstand, but say, let's say there was a receptionist outside uh, in the next room, 
And as this important person came into the through the door, what if the receptionist said to that person, you know, Pastor Steve has no business with you. Why don't you just leave him alone? And if I found that out later, you know, how would I react to that? I would be indignant because that's not right. In my case, who is that important person? That's, that's the question. But in the case of Jesus, these were children. And Jesus said, unless you receive the kingdom of God like these little children, you will not enter the kingdom. And he's saying this to the disciples who literally left all they had and followed Jesus because they wanted to be in the kingdom of God. But yet they still didn't understand. The kind of people that enter into the kingdom of God are like these children who come to Jesus for no other agenda than to be blessed by him, to be touched by him, to be with him, to be blessed by him. Who knows that the only way that they can live is by being received by Christ. Now, that's the first story. And the second story is about this man who came to Jesus. Uh, Mark is is not uh, totally uh, uh, transparent about the nature of this man. But we can... Uh, be supplemented by how this story is told by Matthew and Luke. Uh, Matthew remarks that this man was actually a young man. Uh, The fact that he was young does not appear in our text in Mark. It was just a man. Uh, But he's apparently a young man. And and Luke, uh, in, in his account, actually says that this was a young man who was a ruler, one of the the members of the council. So this was an impressive young man who seemed to have a very great promising future who already has accomplished so much. And, and who is this young man? We, we don't really know. We could kind of guess. And I, I love to guess about things like that. I, I, I will suggest a few things. But anyway, here's a young man who's already accomplished so much in his life that he's uh, he's, he's seen as one of the rulers of the community. And this man comes to Jesus publicly. As Jesus is on his journey on the road, this man ran up to Jesus, verse 17. He knelt down before him and asked him. Now, this is not a prideful young man. This is not somebody who comes to Jesus with his own agenda, in a sense, of being prideful. You know, he doesn't seem that way. He seems very proper. He seems very humble. Uh, why would he do that? Because he had a very earnest desire. He wanted to know. He wanted to get somewhere. It, it wasn't enough to simply be who he is now. And what is his question? He says to Jesus, he asks, good teacher, What must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, uh, the term eternal life is more familiar to the Gospel of John. So it's very interesting that his question is featured that way in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, Many scholars say eternal life is equivalent to the kingdom of God. Uh, Basically mean the same thing. So he is asking to be brief. How can I be a member in this kingdom where God is the king? How can I serve God in my life? How can I be received into the kingdom of God? And Jesus says something very interesting. He says, why do you call me good? You you, you just came to me and you knelt before me and you, you beg of me to know the answer to this question and you call me a good teacher. Do you not know that there is only one who is good and he is God? Is is Jesus refuting the fact that he is divine, that he is the Son of God? Is he saying, I'm not God, I'm nobody, so don't call me good? Uh, No, I think he's getting somewhere. And I I, I like the fact that he is pointing out God and God alone. There's something very unique about God. There, There is this 
God who is alone worthy to be worshipped and alone to be pursued with all his passion. So, so here is a young man who is already pro, uh, prominent in his community trying to come before God and say, how can I belong to you? How can I be a member of your kingdom? How can I come and inherit this, this glorious inheritance of your kingdom reign? And Jesus said something about, do you know God? Do you know that there's something very alone about God, unique? Nothing can compete with God. Nothing. And ultimately, he's going to say what? Nothing, even your great possession, cannot compete with God. Do you not know? Isn't it interesting as he, he leads him to the, the climax, he, he mentions all these commandments, and these are not other than the the second part of the Ten Commandments. Interestingly, he doesn't mention the first four, the four commandments that are often associated with worship, the right kind of worship to God. How do you worship God? You worship God and God alone. You worship God not making any image, thinking that God must be here, God must be there. Oh, no. You must worship him in spirit and truth. You must worship him truly. Do not use God's name in vain. Don't falsely say about God that which is not God. And you must set apart a day of worship as the day that you come into his perfect, perfect uh, Sabbath. The everything coming into order where God is at the center. In that glorious harmony of the creation. You come and rest in him and you worship him. Something about worship, right? None of that is mentioned by Jesus. Well, until the end. When Jesus mentioned the other commandments, the the young man says, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth ever since I was young, ever since I was a child. I kept them. Now, he seems very sure but there's something about this man, something about this young man. His, his, his request, his, his, his quest for an answer to this important question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He's not kidding. He's not just lighthearted. He's very serious about it. And Jesus, in verse 21, looked at him and he loved him. It's not a small thing to be loved by Jesus. What does that mean? That he loved him. Jesus loved him so much that he's going to tell him a very difficult secret, something he didn't yet realize. I'm going to let you know this. This is going to come to you hard. This is going to be difficult for you, but I'm going to tell you because I love you. I speak the truth to you. And Jesus essentially tells him, well, you say you kept all the laws of the Ten Commandments, but what you did miss is the fact that there is one and only God. One and only. You've done all these things to people. You've done them. Now you have gained this great reputation and people love you because you are young and brilliant and you are able. You are able. You are very productive. You are able to lead us even though you are very young. Yet, though his intention seems to be earnest, Yet he had forgotten that there is only one and only God to whom he must come and worship. And the way Jesus put it is this, sell all your possessions, give them away, make your hands empty, don't let anything hinder you, and then 100% come and follow me. I am your king. I am your God. And guess what happens to this young man? He heard the answer that he lacks that one thing. That one thing. And that one thing was what? He did not worship God and God alone because in his heart he was worshiping his great possession. Because he had great possession, he was sad, disheartened, And he went away in great sorrow and did not follow Jesus. 
wow, you know, I, I, I think this is a great example of the, the, the parable of the sower, remember? He sowed seeds, the word of God fell in different types of grounds, and when it fell under the thorns, the thorns choked the life of the seed, and it meant that the desire of great possession and desire for the earthly things have choked the word to bear fruit in his life. And I wonder if his quest ended here. Is this the end of the story? Well, I like to think that there's more. It's not said clearly, but uh, it's alluded somehow. The fact that Jesus loved him can't be taken too lightly. Jesus' love shouldn't be taken lightly. If Jesus loves us, his intent is very uh, stubborn. He's a faithful lover. When he loves us, he loves us to the end. And I like to think that what Jesus said um, at the end of his discourse with his disciples who claim that they've given up everything to follow Jesus, and Jesus uh, compliments them for what they've done. He congratulates them. You've done the right thing, and the, the Lord will see your life through. But he says in verse 31, but many who are first will be last and the last first. So the disciples are now first, and this young ruler is the last don't be so content because maybe there will be a day that one who is the last shall become first. Maybe there will be that great conversion for this young man. And who could this young man be? And I'm thinking, you know, maybe this is the man who comes up at the very end of the story out of nowhere, Joseph of Arimathea, who takes the body of Jesus and buries him in his fresh tomb. A very rich man who appears and who is known as the disciple of Jesus. Could it be him? I, I might even say that this could be Mark, who's writing this story, who apparently was a young man, uh, who was rich. Uh, I don't know about him being a leader, that's not really said, but there's something about Mark, whose other name was John. Maybe that, that was him. I, I'm, I'm making these uh, guesses, not, not because that's so important, but I, I feel like this story is not the end. There's something further going on, I hope. Okay, now I want to bring this, this message to the, to the key, to the very core of what I'm trying to get to, okay? In these two stories, I believe what, uh, what are being contrasted is this, that there's such people who are to be called children, and then there are those who are to be called rich. Those two are contrasted with one another. The question is, are you a child before God, or are you a rich man before God? Are you a rich man, or are you a child? Who is a child? Well, I could, I could look at several places in the Gospel of Mark alone and figure out who a child is meant to be but I'll just take one story for lack of time. And that one story comes in Mark chapter 2. Jesus calls this paralytic, this somebody who was invalid. His entire body was not able to be moved. This, this man who was brought to him. And Jesus looked at him and he called him a child, a little one. And that's, that's very interesting. Was he a child? Was he a young man? Was he an old man? Why did Jesus call him a little person or, or a child? The reason, I think, why Jesus did that is very consistent with to whom Jesus calls children. And here's the man who was brought to Jesus, not by his own will. In a sense, he had, he had no ability to move his body. He was not able to walk. He was not able to do anything. But he was carried by four friends. You know, place him, him on a stretcher, and, and the four friends held each corner and brought him to Jesus. But there's so many people crowding the home where Jesus was. And these four friends were so determined to take this man to Jesus, they went up to the top of the house. They, they made an opening on the roof of the house and lower the stretcher down to where Jesus was. Immediately, Jesus looked at him, 
And I'm sure this was a great nuisance to everyone who was there. I mean, why can't you just wait for your turn to see Jesus? Why do you have to do this? This seems too much. But they did it because they were desperate to bring this man to Jesus. And Jesus immediately replied by saying, Wow, my child. He was looking at the faith of these four friends. And he said, your sins are forgiven. Which was a remarkable statement. You just reconciled with God. You were just as received as a child of God. Oh, you little one. Why? Why was he called a little one? Why was he a child? He was a child because he couldn't do anything on his own. He was not driven by his own personal agenda. He was not going to impress people, nor God. He's not going to be a grown-up. Isn't it interesting that we never want to be a child? We want to be grown-ups. We want to make money and do things our way. We want to be independent. We want to have our own place to live. We want to have something that I can call mine. That's being a grown-up. We all want to be that. But somehow Jesus says, when it comes to your relationship with me, when it comes to your relationship with God, You never say, God, I want to be a grown-up before you. I just want to do things for you, and I want to be a kind of person that already figured out what you want, so I never have to ask you. Oh, no, no, no. Jesus says, no, 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 no. That's not how you come to me. The way you come to me is to understand that you live by my grace and grace alone. You come to me like a child. You come to me with someone who is completely dependent on me and my heart for you, my love for you. You don't don't rely on anything other than my love. When Jesus says, I love you, when Jesus looks at you with love, you say, Lord, that's enough for me. With that, I will go all in because I'm a child to you. On the other hand, who is the rich person? The rich person is somebody who has something else to trust. A rich person may be rich with things. A rich person may be rich with money. A rich person may be rich with many influential friends that I can rely on. Rich person can be rich with many things. Are you rich? Are you rich with your own personal potential? Are you rich with your own possessions? Are you rich with your network? Are you rich with your future that's already secure? Are you feeling like, well, I don't really need anything. Why do I go to God? Well, just to ease my conscience. I just want to feel proper. I worship God because I think it's the right thing to do for me. Are you rich? Because you really don't need anything. You're not desperate. You're not here seeking with your heart. When you hear the word, it's nice. Oh, that's a nice thing to hear. That's a nice thing to be suggested. Or are you desperate? Are you seeking the word of God, the truth, to have bearing upon your life so that you can have eternal life? Are you seeking with all that is who you are? Or are you just simply adding few things to spice up your life? Are you a rich person or are you a poor person? You know, Jesus says it is impossible for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And the illustration that Jesus used is rather remarkable. It's, it's, it's more, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And, and literally, Jesus is firing up your imagination. He's triggering your imagination to, to see how impos- impossible this is. And the disciples were amazed to hear him. They said, wow. Uh, verse 26, they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? If it is so hard for a rich person to be saved, then I wonder, you know, by comparison, how how can anybody be saved? Uh, Because never mind a a camel, a little cat cannot enter through an eye of a needle. Is entering into a kingdom of God so difficult that it's like entering through an eye of a needle? And Jesus said, it is impossible with man. It's impossible with man, but with God. Everything is possible. What is he saying? It's the grace of God that saves you. 
It's the grace of God that brings you into the kingdom of God. You don't come to God as a rich man. You don't come to God as somebody who says, I could do it. But you come to God like a child. Empty your hands. Ask the Lord because he is the Lord of your life. What are you looking for? What are we looking for? A little bit of this or a little bit of that? Or are we looking for life that is truly life? God, I want my life to be worthy before you. I want to live my life as what it ought to be as a glory to you and an enjoyment of who you are. I want to be fully brought into your kingdom. Bring me in. I want to be in. I want to be in. Sometimes you have to let things go. I wonder what that one thing is. Jesus said, you lack one thing. Well, in his case, that one thing was pretty big. That one thing was none other than knowing God as to be the one and only. If he didn't know it, that ruins everything. What is the one thing that you have? Sometimes you have to let that go. A young pastor reached out to me while I was traveling. And I think the day that I talked to him on a, on, a, on a long distance call, nowadays there are many ways you can call for free, so I think we were talking on FaceTime or something. And uh, I asked him, it's one of those mornings that I was doing my devotion, and, and he called, and I talked to him, and he's looking for a, a new ministry position. And I've been kind of talking with him about this, and uh, he said, I, I finally went to do the interview, and I liked the people there, but there are a lot of conditions that didn't seem to really jive with what I need. Uh, and and he, there, there are many things, so I'm not really pigeonholing holding him, like I'm not making him just this, but one thing he did say was, I don't think they're going to cover my moving cost. He has to move some distance. He said, you know, when I calculated all the expense that I need to move my things, uh, it's going to cost me thousands and thousands of dollars. He, he mentioned something like five, six thousand dollars. And maybe to some of you, it, it's very little, but for him, that was just too much to, to spend unless the church where he's going to go will pay for that. On one side of my heart, I didn't really think that church would not pay if that was absolutely necessary. But on the other hand, this young pastor was still a single man, and uh, he lived alone. I, I wonder how much stuff he had. So my suggestion to him was, well, put all your stuff on Craigslist. Sell them. And why don't you sell them? And whatever money that you think would be required for the moving cost, I would actually not take any of it, but go buy everything new. He said, well, I never thought of that. I, you know, I'm not saying things are that simple, but sometimes things are simple. It, it's interesting why some people can never think simply. Why? Because they never think that way. Whatever I have, I have. I can never let that go. What are some things that you have to let go? What is that one thing? What is that one thing? You know, sometimes, this is a hard part, but we need to hear it. God makes us children when we don't want to be children. And one example is when Paul told us about his thorn in his flesh. He cried out to God, God, remove this thorn in my flesh because, number one, it's painful. Number two, I think it hinders my ministry. I think I could be a lot more effective if I could get rid of this thorn in my flesh. He says he asked God three times, remove this thorn from my flesh. And God each time replied to him, no. Why not? God said, my grace is sufficient for you. In other words, what God is saying is that thorn is what keeps you as a child before me. You have amazing gifts, Paul. You have seen the vision of the heavens. You have the revelation, the mystery of God. You are able to do all these things. You are the greatest 
quote-unquote theologian who ever lived on the earth. But you need to be a child to me. And the only way I know that you will remain a child is when you have this thorn in your flesh. Every moment you will know. God, your grace, is what makes things sufficient for me. Nothing else. I met a friend while I was in Korea. A dear friend, a pastor who I love. We're same age. And him and I, we, we click. I love, I love him. I love talking to him because he's so affirming. I love affirming him. We're like in that kind of mode where we mutually encourage one another. I heard that he was not physically well. I didn't know the nature of the whole deal. And I found out that he has a kind of blood cancer. He told me that it'll never be cured, at least by what is medically available. It's a kind of blood cancer that will not immediately, you know, kill me unless the problem occurs that it clots the blood and that could happen at any time unless I continue to take the medication. So he's on a medication. It's like some kind of anti-cancer medication. I don't know exactly what. Somebody could explain to me later, perhaps. And he says, whenever I take this medication, I lose all my energy. I sink down. So the only way, doctor says, I can build my stamina is by exercising and eating well. I try to do my best to eat well and to exercise. And then he says, you know what, I think in a sense I became healthier. I could see that he's slimmer. I could see that he's a bit older looking. I could see that he's a little bit worn. But he says, I'm doing okay. But I have to battle this every day. I thought about that. You know, what would it mean that he has to depend on this medication every day? Only way that he could somehow continue is by relying on this. Every day he has to just go a step further, fighting his fatigue. His ministry continues. His ministry continues in ways that's a little different than the way it used to be. He seems like a man who's living his last days, yet he knows that he can continue by God's grace. So there's a sense of something tremendous. There's a sense of some kind of mystery. There's a sense of a kind of awe and dignity that's not achieved by human efforts. There's something very deeply godly about the way things are in his life. I think God is keeping him to be a child. You have to rely on me 100%. He knows that every moment is by God's grace. God could take him any day. But as long as God will keep him here, he knows that his life will feature faithful service to him. He's like a child. There's no boasting. If God wills, I will do what he calls me to do. It's a different kind of life. What is that for you, brothers and sisters? Some of you are very young. Maybe you haven't really thought through things that far. But I know even at young age, you face things that's very difficult to face. You may have certain situations or conditions that's not easy to resolve. But did you ever think that through all those things, what God is doing is, I want you to be a child before me. And you shall inherit the kingdom of God. Old and young, I want to be in the kingdom of God. May the Lord bless you.
as you think about this in the coming week, every day reflecting on it, grow in grace. Lord bless you. Let's pray. Father, we thank